roads lead to Manchester, where the Rugby League World Cup 2021 is ready to take centre stage. This city will host the men's, women's and wheelchair World Cup finals this November. Ahead of the tournament, we bring you a unique series of in-depth conversations with some very special guests. Some have never set foot on a rugby pitch. Others are superstars of the game. All have rugby league embedded in their soul. This is Impact. Welcome to the official Rugby League World Cup podcast. In this first episode, we've been meeting a man who is a true icon of rugby league, as well as an Australian sporting hero. Mal Manga won everything the game had to offer him as a player, and in 2017, as coach, he guided Australia to World Cup glory. Now he's back to try and lead the Kangaroos to more success. But what makes him tick? And how does he see the future of this great sport? Well, my guest today for the inaugural episode of this series is in rugby league terms, a living legend, a man who's what? won the World Cup as a player and as a coach, and you're going to be here to defend the trophy in the autumn, Mal Meninga. Yeah, Terrific thank you. Terrific to see oh. you. Thank you. For uh, nice to be here, thank you. How are your preparations yeah. going? It's not long to go now. Yeah, no, it's, well, nearly 100 days, uh, we've been told. So um, it, yeah, some people describe it as a junket, uh, but we just, you know, we describe it as a, you know, a worthwhile trip, you know, mm. journey over here to get things right. So, I mean, obviously, we are, we are the... Uh, defending uh, champions and we want to get it right. We want to obviously win the tournament. There's an expectation being Australian, being a kangaroo that in rugby league terms that, you know, we are the, the best of the best. So, you know, we, we don't want to let our, our our community, our rugby league community down back home. This has been billed as the biggest and best rugby league world cup ever. Do you get yeah. that sense? I get, I get it. And it's, it's diversity as well, inclusiveness. You know, we've got the wheelchair, mm. wheelchair, we've got the women's and we've got the men's. And um, it's the first time it's ever been done at the same time. And I, you know, I feel very honoured and privileged to be part of all that. Mm. The, the Rugby League World Cup has been around since the 1950s, mm. but it has had a, a very mixed history. Let me take you back to when you were... Uh, a young man growing up in Queensland. How aware were you of the World Cup of Rugby League? And was, uh, it, was it as big a deal perhaps as it is now? No, well, when I grew up it was kangaroo tours. And that was sort of the universal uh, goal that most rugby league kids growing up wanted to aspire to, you know. So, I mean, playing for your state obviously was important, but you know, the pinnacle was to play for the kangaroos on a, on a kangaroo tour, particularly to the UK. And yeah, we would come over here for 10 to 12 weeks, you know, playing against club sides, and the national squad, squad, and then we go over and play in France on the way home. So that was sort of the pinnacle where there was no real um, focus on World Cups and it wasn't, hasn't happened because it was never been cyclic. And we just yeah. sort of, we played the first test or the last test of a series and that goes towards World Cup points and then that gets added over a period of, you know, four or five years and then we then we play a World Cup against, the, you know, whoever comes one and two. So, yeah, rugby, uh, Kangaroo Tours was big and then obviously the English Super League started and that mm. that sort of coincided with our window in summer over here. Uh, kangaroo tours disappeared. Now we've got this international um, window at the end of the year and the World Cup's become a major focus. So yeah, it's, um, you know, I'm really looking forward to, you know, we won in 2017. Seems like yesterday we've had a whole heap of global things happening, you know, with, the, with COVID and things like that. And um, it's just great that we've got the national, you know, program back in the forefront of everyone's thinking. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we're going to ask every interviewee about their earliest memory of rugby league. Now, your father played rugby yeah, league. Yeah. Can you recall, though, a moment when you realised you were hooked and then you maybe wanted to follow in his footsteps? Um, I carried my dad's football bag at 10 months old <laughs> into, the, into the dressing rooms, you know, so... Um, you were I grew, breathing. I it, grew up. I grew up a sandboy. Yeah. I grew up, you know, a mascot. Um, you know, collecting bottles around the the, uh, the fence of the, the local footy, you know, game, and um, trying to make five cents or something for the day. You know, it's just things like that. You know, vast memories of dad playing, and uh, obviously mum being a great supporter. You know, she was the the typical rugby league wife mm. and and mother. You know, works in the canteens. Grabs all the all the kids' jerseys, you know, washes them, put them on the line, all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, it was mine was a typical upbringing in rugby league, and um, I can't remember if you know, if I 
if I, how I got the passion, but I just grew up in it. It was mm. innate in me. It's it's something I've, that I've always been involved with. And um, again, like I said before, I'm very privileged to be still involved uh, you know, into my 60s, you know, so it's it's been a, a passion and a love of mine for many, many years. You were playing as a young man, but you also had a, a career in the police as well. When did you realize that rugby league could be a career? Um, well, it, it wasn't really, mm. because I mean, when I played it was all, you always had a job. You know, even even the back end of my career, I always worked, you know, so I still made a, a living out of, out of the game, um, but in, in conjunction with work, you know, so policemen, um, I always wanted to be a police when I was a young kid, you know, even though I was playing rugby league, rugby league was a, a passion and a, and a hobby where, you know, being a policeman was work, you know, mm. for me and, uh, and a passion too, you know, growing up, um, you know, always wanted to be a policeman, I don't know why, but I always did. And that, but then I came over here and played for Saints, St. Yeah. Helens in um, the 84, 85 season and um, just seen, you know, how a one team town was highly respected, followed, supported, you know, and, um, I felt that I, I needed that sense, and you had to go down and play in the the Sydney competition in those years. So this is, I'm talking, you know, late seventies and and uh, early eighties, where you, you had to prove yourself, you know, as a rugby league player. So it wasn't, but it wasn't until I came here that I felt that I, I should go down there and and prove myself in the what we call in Australia the big smoke. Did you get a sense coming here and playing for St Helens that this sport was? living, breathing part of the community. Exactly, that's it, you know, and, um, and I, I, did, I did a bit of research, obviously, with the, with the Canberra Raiders, and um, they're sort of on the up. It was a great rugby league breeding ground around yeah. there. You got great development programs. Um, the, the good, had really good support, and they had this talent, talent pool coming through as well at the same time, but just be involved in, in that St. Helens community, you know, you just, mm. the amount of support you had, particularly if you're winning, of course, you know, but, um, the amount of support you had, you just didn't want to let that community down. You know, every time you you put on a St Helens jersey, it's you know it's enriched with so much history. You know, because rugby league started way before it did in Australia here. Mm. You know, so it's a it's where it all started. Rugby league, where someone made it made a choice that you had to you know you had to get compensated for playing sport. Um, and you know, we're very thankful for that. But for me to go back after experiencing that one team town and how much how much it meant to everyone. Um, I went on the look for that, and that's why I went to, to Canberra, and it didn't disappoint me. Mm. And did you, did, you, did you try and incorporate some of that feeling that you'd had here into your time at Canberra, and did you, did you try and drive the town behind well, the team? Yeah, well, exactly. It's, as individuals, you know, yeah. we're profiled. You know, we're in a community that um, we play at the elite level um, in, in sport, in rugby league. So, I mean, yeah, you want to be your best, and you want to do your best, and... Um, and you want to, you want to, you do it for a number of reasons. Obviously, you do it for yourself. You know, you, you want to be the best person and play. You want it, you can be, and obviously for your mates. But then it's the rugby league community that sort of binds it all. You know, so when we did win it in '89, it's 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 often said that that's when Canberra grew a soul. You know, um, because all of a sudden the whole community in, in Canberra is a, a transient community. So you get people coming from all walks of life, um, all parts of Australia and the world. And, uh, and because of the success of, of the Raiders at, at that time, that community just come together. I remember when we won the grand final, 300,000 people there at the time, 100,000 people streaming the, the side of the, the, uh, the roadway just celebrating success with us. You know, it was just an extraordinary uh, place to be at that particular time. And, um, and you, like I said, it's, 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 bigger than, it's bigger than just playing footy, you know. It's, it's, mm. it's about community. It's about the spirit and, and not letting people down. And if someone, does, if someone does get hurt or, you know, you help pick them up and, you know, just, it, you know, that's, that's what I derived out of, out of playing sport in general is that it's bigger than just running on the field on a Sunday afternoon and playing 80 minutes of, of rugby league. It's, it's the all week. It's what you, how you contribute to community. By that time, you were a regular for your country. Can you remember the first time that you were picked for Australia and what it meant to you? Um, yeah, well, we didn't have mobile phones in those days and and uh, hardly any telephones <laughs> around. And uh, so I, I remember, obviously, I was playing for my club, uh, South. We made the grand final, um, and uh, well, there we, we didn't win it, unfortunately. But um, you know, we went back to the club and, and sort of having a few beers with your mates and celebrating 
you know, really successful year because, you know, there's only two teams that make the grand final and we were part of it. And, and you sort of, but in the, in the back of your mind, you're sort of sitting over in the corner waiting for that phone call mm. at the club, you know, f- to, for someone to tell you that you actually made the Australian side. And, and I, I remember, you know, vividly, you know, getting, getting picked for Australia and going on a kangaroo tour was you know, the, the biggest thing for me because um, that's what we aspire to do. Was was being a kangaroo was that the pinnacle for you as a player at the time? And is it still? Oh, it is it did, very much so. And that's how that's how I talk to my players. Um, mm. You know, there's a big a big beast over home called State of Origin, yeah. and uh, which is a global phenomenon. Like you got people that don't, don't even watch rugby league, you know, rally around a, their their family or friends and get around a table and watch the watch television because this this thing called State of Origin. It's bigger than Ben Hur over there, and so, so we had to, we had to, and we're still doing it. You know, we're still trying to look at well, the international the international game is really important to, you know, for every every nation, particularly over here as well. That you know we've got to put on the best World Cup we possibly can. So I mean, it is the best, the best. You know, you're representing your country. There's no prouder moment than, than putting on your country colours and, and being successful. You know, yeah. doing your utmost to to um, instil that pride and. And you know when you go back home that you know they they're proud of what you've done and achieved. You know I think that's there's no better feeling than that than um, people you don't know you know sitting in front of a TV you know wanting you to do well. And as you said at the time, the kangaroo tours were the ultimate. But then yeah. the World Cup came around in '88, and you got ruled out of the final with a broken yeah, arm. Yeah. Did, was the World Cup becoming a bit more of a thing at that point? Did, were, you know, oh, were you so disappointed to miss the final? Oh, absolutely. You, you yeah. want to play every game you can play. You know, yeah. so I mean, I'm a terrible watcher. You know, I want to be involved. You do. You know, you want to be, if you're yeah. you're good enough, you feel you're good enough, you're confident enough. You, know, you want to be part of the, part of the team. It, it does. It hurts. It hurts watching. You hurt hurts your, your comrades, your teammates. Do really well, and you're not part of that. You know, because you want to contribute. You want to make a difference when you. When you put a jersey on and you know get on run on onto a, onto a field of sport, you know, so yeah, it hurt a bit, but um, it makes you want to work harder though too, you know. So you come back off that, you do everything you possibly can because you miss it, you know, and um, which I did. So yeah, work harder than you ever have to ever had. Um, got yourself prepared the best way you you can, and um, you, you get back into the, into the into the team. And then four years later, the World Cup again. This time. Your captain, yeah, and you get to the final, and you're yeah. playing Great Britain, yeah. GB. How much do you remember about that game? Yeah, well, I, I don't remember too much that we won, you know. So I mean, that's, you know, <laughs> you know I mean, in, a, in a team that you that you, you know you, you you're the victor. Um, I, what I remember is in '92 when I was playing for the Raiders, we didn't even, even made the finals. Hmm. So I put on about two stone. You know, coming into the World Cup, no, I didn't. It wasn't too stone, but you know, I put on a few pounds, and and uh, yeah, just trying to get myself fit and, and ready to, to play uh, in the World Cup, you know, final at, at Wembley. You know, so that was my task. I just wanted to. I didn't want to let the nation down. I know I was the captain, and I let myself go at the back end of the season, which you know wasn't the right thing to do. Um, but I thought I thought we played okay. You know, we we did it. We did enough to to win the World Cup, um, much to the dismay of the. Of the English supporters. <laughs> Do you remember the, the Steve Renouf try and oh, yeah, the, the final moments of that game? Yeah, it was yeah. so tense, wasn't it? It was. You know, it was great. You know, that's why you play footy. You know, you always, you dream about you know making a difference at the end of in the games. You know, when you prepare for a game in anything, I mean, sport up in, in life. You know, you you prepare yourself the worst. You, you know, there's this this bit this uh, scenario where it's seventy ninth. And thirtieth second, we you know you, you're going to do something special that's going to win you the game. You know it's it could be a goal kick, it could be a try, it could be a run, it could be a special tackle. That's what you prepare yourself for. Mm. You know, so it's uh, when it doesn't happen like that. Um, sometimes you get let down. You know, so you, you love you live for those moments when um, a moment you know makes a difference in a, in a game, and um, in those moments, you know. You want to be on your side. So in that particular game, Stephen Roof, I think Kevin Wallace was involved in, in that movement. He came off off the bench, um, made a difference. You know, passed to Steve, and Steve's in the corner. You know, so I remember kicking the goal from the sideline. You know, so um, you, it's those moments you live for. And to be the captain of your country to lift the trophy. That's the top, isn't it? It I is mean, very much so. There was there a point where you're thinking, do you know what? I don't need to do anything else. Yeah. After that. <laughs> no, I want to do it again. Yeah. You know, because that's 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 you get a bug. You get, you get yeah. this. You know, you, um, 
you, you get this thing about winning. You, know, you, just, you just love you love winning. You know, it becomes a habit, and so does losing. You know, at times. So um, yeah, you always we always get told that by our coaches. So winning becomes a habit. So it gets infectious, and you know when you when you're winning all the time, your confidence is up. Um, you know, you feel like you can do anything in a game, and, and when you hold that 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 trophy up, it makes it all worthwhile. But what's next? You know, what's next? What do I, what do, I do next? You know, so um, that's the way I've always looked at achievement. You know, yeah. um, you got to celebrate, of course. You know, we celebrate it well. Uh, it allows you it allows you to come off that off that ledge. You know, and then you get back, start preparing for your next challenge. So, how then did it compare, if you can, to coaching the team and lifting the trophy as the head coach yeah, it's a in t- 2017. How did it compare being yeah, the captain to being totally the head coach? It's a totally different outlook. The way I, way I look at it, you know, it's, it's about the players. It's not about me. It's not about the people around me staff-wise. It's about the players. And um, I have a saying that you don't have to prove how smart you, you are as a coach. You've got to prove how much you care about the players. And uh, it's them. It's them that put the effort in. You, know, you, you provide the environment and you provide the tools for them to be successful. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, they go out in the, on the field. They play. They put the effort in. Um, they're making the, those special moments special. You know, they're the ones that, that put the effort in. So um, they deserve the accolades. They should be put, you know, uh, forefront of any, anything uh, we achieve uh, as, a, as a collector, as a team. It is a team, but the players are really important. Let's wheel it forward to this year's World Cup. It's going ahead after a year's delay. Yeah. How did you feel when you heard about the postponement last year? And, and I guess, how have you managed to deal with that year's delay as a coach? I fully understood it, you know. Mm-hmm. So, um, and talking to the players, I mean, and even over in Australia, we all wanted the World Cup to go last year, go, get mm-hmm. going last year. But it was just a time and place where, you know, the, the sensibility prevailed and I felt that it was the right decision. And it wasn't because of the physical, or the, it's all around their mental health, you know, because it's been locked away, there's res- a lot of restrictions and constraints uh, on all players globally, you know, in, in our sport. That, that And it wasn't just the, wasn't just the players, uh, it was their families. The families were locked away. They, they were sort of under the same constraints as well, so they were starting to feel it, you know. So from a mental, a mental health point of view, I think it was the right decision. And, and lo and behold, 12, nearly 12 months later, um, Everyone's feeling better about it. Um, everyone's looking forward to it. Um, you just would have seen recently the Pacific Cups played over over in Australia. How much people are looking forward to the international game. So yeah, there's a there's a real yearning at the moment, and that's why again, you know, we want to come over here and we want to provide you know, the best experience for the fans. Yeah, it's really wet the appetite. I guess yes, this year's yeah. delay. When you look at the importance of this tournament to the global game of rugby league, the, the international game, but also the, the growth of the game, how important do you think it's going to be the six weeks in October, November? It's a, it's a chance to reboot the international game. And with so much inclusiveness and diversity in what we're doing, you know, again, around the wheelchair, the women and the men, it's the perfect time, the perfect timing to do that. You know, so everyone's on board. The players are on board. Uh, when we get over here, we all want to do well. Um, so I'm really excited by it all. I'm really, I mean, and again, I talk to the players how excited they are about coming over. You know, so we haven't been anywhere for three years. Yeah. And my team, my team, I think most of them, most of them I didn't even tour it before. You know, most of them would have stayed, been around Australia or in, through the Pacific. That's it. They wouldn't have, they wouldn't have experienced um, you know, England and the north of England with some, how much support they'll get for mm. rugby, you know, them playing rugby league and how identifiable they will be, you know? That's what I think I, I mentioned the other day around, around you know, rugby league was a vehicle um, and had huge social impact, um, certainly in Australia and in, in the rugby league world because they were the only sport that kept going. You know, we, we, uh, we made, our executive made some really tough decisions and we kept, kept it on TV where people at home were watching, and I think we grew our audience, our rugby audience, and they said, well, what's this game, you know? Uh, this is not a bad game. We yeah. might watch a bit more of it. So I think just through that, that, that time. So the, the timing's perfect now. So we've got a greater audience watching our, our great game, and if we can put on a great spectacle, you know, through the World Cup, all teams, and the spirit that, you know, I've obviously been, I've as a player and as a coach, the spirit that, 
that is uh, emanates out of World Cups is is fantastic. You know, yeah. it's like a festival. It's a festival of rugby league. So um, it's a really important um, tournament for for us as passionate rugby league people. The year that you played in, there were some global superstars in the game. Um, it, it, could, it could be said that maybe those superstars aren't prominent at the moment. Is this tournament the chance where people can explode onto the yeah, well, and I mean, transcend the sport? Yeah, well, well, we hope so. You know, if it doesn't happen now, I think it, mm. it's a start again. As like I said, it's a, it's a chance to reboot our um, the, the international game of you know and uh, give it a higher profile. And if you create a lot of interest and create a bit of momentum, um, we've got some of the greatest athletes on the, on earth. Honestly, you know, um, well-rounded athletes that. You know, are good at most things, you know. So, um, yeah, it's, it's you know, I'm really excited. I'm really excited about being involved. You mentioned the, the diversity and inclusion uh, element to this World Cup with the women's tournament, um, the wheelchair competition and the men's all taking place at the same time, equal prize money. Yeah. From an Australian perspective, how aligned are the three teams and how much dialogue have you had with the, the women's team, the wheelchair yeah. team? Yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot. We're, that's why one of the reasons why we're over here. We're actually looking at facilities for them and going yeah. to pass back information to them. Um, we've been aligned with the, the women's, the Gillaroos, for the last five years. You know, because when I took on, we, um, the, our Gillaroos coach Brad Dolan, we worked together. You know, so everything, everything we do around the way we create an environment, the way we we value behaviour standards and things like that, we do it collectively. We do it together. Mm -hmm. We we share. We share events together, you know, we go watch them, they watch us, you know, we celebrate together. Things like that, you know, I think it's a lip. And our, our women's women's game over in Australia is, I mean, I can't tell you how much it's improved. <laughs> you know, I, I watched it in, in 16 and, and we just, come on, we come off a, an interest, uh, a state of origin women's game just recently and the, the standards is enormous. It's attractive rugby league they're all athletes great skill base mm -hmm. and so passionate about the game and i know the wheelchair guys are too so passionate but <laughs> watching them gets just un unbelievable uh the talent and those how physical it gets as well you have know? you tried so, it have you tried I wheelchair know, well, rugby league? exactly well i'm not going to try it because i know how good they are <laughs> they'll make me look silly <laughs> i mean they are incredible athletes oh, and un unbelievable unbelievable their skill set you know it's um yeah so it's going to be it's, it's fantastic i know it uh, with the wheelchair is going to happen the night before, you know, mm -hmm. which is great. Um, and then the men's and women's on a on an equal footing, on an equal stage. Old Travis, how good's that? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, it's, <laughs> we expect it to be a sellout, of course, for the final. And there's a lot of you know hope, I think, in Australia that you'll reach the final and potentially retain the trophy. But Australia haven't played for a long time. You haven't yeah. had a game. Yeah. How? Are you dealing with that conundrum of squad selection, the fact that you're, you haven't had the team together as a group? I guess there's, you'll know the pressure yeah, that's on you to yeah. succeed as well. Well, it's a common purpose though, you know? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, we're all, you know, the players that we select, they're playing for their country. They're all, and it's, it's, mm. it's, it is an aspiration of theirs, you know? So, and the tour, you know, to come over and tour, I mentioned it before, it's, it's, it's a special place to come over here and play rugby league, you know, in the north of England. You know, it doesn't get much better. You know, the the atmosphere of your crowds and the singing and the chanting and and obviously the booze. But then there's an appreciation. You know, if you're mm. playing really good footy, rugby league, um, they they admire that and appreciate that, and you get applause. You know, it's it is a great place to play. The finals at Old Trafford. What does that venue mean to you as an individual? Oh, you know, we, I play at Suncorp. You know, so I mean, that's I'm a good mama. I'm a big Queensland, of course. You know, I was born and bred in Queensland, and. Uh, and we get to play at Suncorp, uh, you know, Old Trafford is nearly as good as that. You've got happy memories of that place, haven't you? Absolutely, yeah, no, it's been a been happy hunting ground for me. Um, uh, yeah, but, you know, that's our aim. We obviously want to play at Old Trafford, but um, we're, not playing the, we're, not playing, we're not playing Old Trafford, we're actually playing in opposition, so we've got to get ourselves right and play well there. Have you thought about what it would mean to lift the World Cup at Old Trafford where you had so much success as a player? Uh, again, as a, as a as a coach, mm. I want to see my captain raise it. You know, um, to me, it's um, it's part of all the good work we do behind the scenes and how we lead how we lead our our preparation, our team. You know, and how well they play. I think that's the the, the ultimate for us, and we get to celebrate that and and and, and um, help them help them. You know, be part of it as well. But at the end of the day, like I said before, as a player, they're your best memories. Who do you think will be your biggest threat to lifting that trophy again? Oh, I think the usual suspects, you know, New Zealand 
and England. Um, Tonga is starting to make enormous, you know, inroads into the international space. I believe Samoa's, a, you know, if they get their act together, they're, yeah, they're, they're dangerous. Um, so I would imagine out of, out of those, of Fiji was, you know, Fiji's made uh, the last couple of you know, semi-finals in uh, the World Cup. So that's starting to make uh, some huge inroads. You've got them in your first game. Yeah, and Scotland, them. of course. Yeah, we've got Scotland, yeah, yeah. yeah. And we've got Italy as well. So, you know. A good group. Well, I don't mind. Well, we couldn't play in Rome, but anyway, it's just, that's that's uh, that's enough for another 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 story. But uh, yeah, I me, mean, it's um, and the diversity of that is is fantastic too. You know, obviously, we go into those games huge favourites, but at the end of the day, um, you know, it's just great to see those nations being represented. Just finally, um, whatever happens to Australia in the World Cup, what would you think would represent a successful rugby league World Cup for the sport generally? It's a really good question, eh? I mean, I think, I think the spirit of it all. You know, I remember, yeah. I remember coming over here. I was with the Kumul side, in, with Adrian Lamb in two thousand and thirteen, and the spirit of the of the the contest. You know, it wasn't the games, but the community and the way that the it was rugby league was celebrated in all those communities was. I mean, it it made me. I gave me a little goose bubbles because it was just fantastic. You know, the crowds were very appreciative, and um, the way that it was broadcast was. Fantastic, and like every game on BBC this year, man, honestly, how good's that? You know, it's in, in all games, so again, you know, men's, women's, and, and the wheelchair. So, I mean, um, I think the spirit, I mean, it is a festival, it, it is a showcase for our, our great game. And, um, you know, if we can lift the spirit of others, and, and, and with that, you know, the spirit of our games emerges, I think it'd be a fantastic uh, tournament, and someone a tournament that everyone will remember and, and praise. Yeah, we certainly hope so. Mal, mm. it's been a pleasure. We look forward to seeing you back here in October. Thank you very much I'm for joining us. forward to coming back. Thank you. <laughs> Our thanks to Mal Meninga for his time and good luck to him and Australia when they kick off their tournament against Fiji on October the 15th, the same day, of course, England play Samoa in the opening game. Thank you for tuning in to the first episode of This Is Impact and be sure to join us again soon as we continue our build-up to the biggest, best and most inclusive Rugby League World Cup ever. <laughs>